When you follow Jesus in his footsteps and you pause to listen to the words that come out of his mouth, there are times that he comes off as a heartless, cold, judgmental brute. For example, campus ministry the other week at Purdue, we're reading through Matthew's gospel and we, we come to this story where two potential disciples come up to Jesus and one of them says, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus, and he says, first, well, first let me go bury my father. And Jesus says to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you come follow me. Wow, Jesus, that's, that's really cold. Or remember the time that, that Jesus fed the thousands with a few fish and a few loaves of bread and, and he dismisses the crowd when they're full and they get in the boat and cross to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, but the crowd see that. And so they, they run ahead of him on the shore and, and they kind of beat him there to his destination. And he launches into this sermon on bread and then he says this, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Wow, Jesus, that's pretty exclusive. And what's this business about eating your flesh and drinking your blood? That's just kind of odd. So as we follow Jesus in his final steps, and we listen to his words, these words that we hear tonight make him sound like a heartless, cold, judgmental brute. And it's not even words that he says to someone, it's to a something, to a fig tree. We are in what we call Holy Week. The, this is the week at the end of which Jesus goes to the cross and he suffers and dies and is buried in the tomb. On Sunday, Jesus starts off at the top of the Mount of Olives and his disciples put him on a donkey and he rides down the Mount of Olives to the, the shouts and the acclaims of the disciples and the crowd saying, Hosanna, save us, Lord, descendant of David. And Jesus rides down the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley up into the city and he walks around, but because it's late, he goes back out of the city up the Mount of Olives east and crosses the top of the Mount of, of Olives and, and there he stays in this village called Bethany. If you remember, some important people live there. There's this lady named Martha and her sister Mary and their brother Lazarus and it's probably at one of these homes that he stays the night. So now it's Monday morning in, in Luke, or I'm sorry, in Mark chapter 11. And Jesus gets up early with his disciples and they begin to walk across the top of the Mount of Olives with the sun rising to their backs in the east. And Jesus sees a fig tree in the distance and it's full of leaves. And he's hungry because he hasn't had breakfast. And so he goes to see if there are any figs on it. Now, in Palestine, fig trees were very important to the, the people of Israel. Not only was this a staple in their diet, but, but fig trees were a cash crop because they produced fruit twice a year. Once in June, another time in about August or September. The fig tree grew about 10 to 15 feet tall, so think about the height of a basketball hoop and then maybe a little bit taller than that. And in the wild, they could grow as tall as 25 feet. So Jesus sees this fig tree. He's hungry, and he goes up to see if there are any figs on it. And it said this was not the season for figs, and, and that was true. Because Passover time is about April. But this tree is an anomaly because it is in full foliage. And so Jesus goes up expecting to find figs. But this fig tree promises much, but it produced nothing. There were no figs on it. So what does Jesus do? He curses the tree. May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And Mark says, and his disciples were listening. Well, of course they were. This is weird. This is odd. Jesus sounds like a, a, a heartless, cold, judgmental brute saying this to a, a fig tree. But what's the point? What happens right after this? 
Jesus walks down the Mount of Olives, across the Kidron Valley, up into the temple complex, and he begins to clean house. The temple complex was made of several courtyards. The outer courtyard was known as the courtyard of the Gentiles. This was for folks that were not Jewish but had come to know Yahweh as Lord and Savior, that this is the only true God, and they worshipped him, but this was the place where they could worship at the temple. What the religious leaders had done was they had set up shop in the court of the Gentiles. There they sold sacrifices that the Lord had required for the Jews to bring to the the altar in front of the temple. And then also you had to pay a, a temple tax. And you had, had to have the right currency. So if you travel the distance, this was actually a great service for you. Because you're not going to bring your flocks and your herds a long distance, so this is good. We can buy our animals here. And we've got to pay the temple tax. It's a good thing. We want to have God's house be kept up and looking nice. But where they did this was the issue. Can you imagine coming to Bethlehem Lutheran Church tonight and seeing and hearing and smelling full-grown cattle and year-old lambs and rams and goats and doves? And if you came to church tonight and you heard the haggling of people over the rate of currency exchange, it would be very distracting. And then you'd probably wonder, are they charging a fair price for these animals? Is the rate of currency rate exchange fair? And so this is why Jesus cleans house. He drives the money changers out. He drives the animals out. Because he, he came to the temple just like he came to the fig tree because it showed all sorts of promise. But there were no figs. The main point of this part of the, the lesson that Jesus is trying to teach his disciples is that God expects to find fruits of faith. So what does Jesus see when he approaches you and, and me? Does he see a tree full of healthy leaves but no figs? We come to this, this place, this beautiful building and we dedicate our our time and our energy and we even give money and we use our our abilities and our our talents but how often we fail to take to heart the words that are spoken here we hear things that are said and we think to ourselves I wish so and so were here because they really need to hear this I'm glad so-and-so is here tonight because they, I hope they're paying attention because they really need to hear this. How how often on a Sunday morning or on a, a Wednesday night during Lent, we open our mouths to confess the sins of our mouth but then very quickly turn around and, and open up that same mouth not to build up our brothers and sisters in Christ but but instead to tear them down. I don't know about you but When Jesus walks up and looks at me, he sees a lot of leaves, but not too many figs that are being produced. Our Savior cursed the fig tree to drive home the truth of a a parable that he had taught his disciples earlier in his ministry, and, and I'm sure the disciples recalled this. Jesus said, A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it, but he did not find any. So he said to the gardener, Look, for three years now I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and I have found none. Cut it down. Why even let it use up the soil? But the gardener replied to him, Sir, leave it alone this year until I dig around it, put fertilizer on it. If it produces fruit next year, fine. But if not, then cut it down. This parable was told not as a warning to all the fig trees that were growing in Palestine, but as a warning for you and for me. But if you paid attention to that parable, it reveals some characteristics about our God, and that's what I want you to go home with tonight. How does God reveal himself in that parable? As a kind God? As a loving God? 
a nurturing God and a patient God and a forgiving God. And that's exactly what he is with you and with me. That, that this God would send his son whose final steps would lead to a cross so that we might be forgiven. And that's exactly what we are. You are forgiven. Let that message of forgiveness be the sunlight and the water that causes you, O oh tree of God, to grow and to be healthy and produce fruit for him. Now you're wondering about the rest of the story because you know what happens. So Monday this happens. Jesus goes down to the temple, cleans house. They leave again, the same way that they came in east out of the city. Tuesday morning they wake up again. The sun is rising to their backs to the east. They're heading across the top of the Mount of Olives and there's the fig tree. But it's withered down to its roots. There's a huge pile of dead leaves at the base and Peter points at it and says, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Yeah, he's excited about this because you just don't see this happen like this in 24 hours. But why would Jesus do this? Why would he suck the life out of this tree with his words? He's trying to teach his disciples another lesson. He said, have faith in God. Truly I tell you, Whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, everything that you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. The lesson? Prayer works. Prayer is effective. Prayer is powerful. Prayer moves mountains. But do we always believe that? We pray for cancer to go away. We pray for a marriage to be mended. We pray for an unbelieving soul to come to faith in Jesus. And it doesn't happen instantly, like with the fig tree. But again, what do we know about our God? What kind of God is he? He's an omniscient God. He's an omnipotent God. He is full of unlimited grace for you kind of God. And because we know those things about him, we know that we will go to him in, in prayer and know that he is going to answer it in a way that is best for us. Because he's a father that sees the big picture. He sees the end game. And sometimes we know that he answers with, you know what, just wait. Just wait with this one. And other times he says, you know what, I, I have something better in mind for you. So what about that, that prayer that moves mountains then? Because as Jesus is, is saying these words, he's standing on the Mount of Olives and no doubt is pointing to the Dead Sea because you can see the Dead Sea from the top of Mount of Olives. So if you were going to go south to the Appalachian Mountains for spring break and were to offer this prayer, and the Appalachian Mountains were to be uprooted and thrown into the Atlantic Ocean, and you recorded this all on your cell phone and posted it to YouTube, what would happen to that video? It would go viral. But it would be all leaves and no figs, right? So what is Jesus' point? First of all, trust that he will answer your prayer. Trust and do not doubt that what you ask for, you will receive it. He said so. But secondly, trust that he will answer your prayers according to what he has promised you. If I, if I pray to my father, please send mountain loads of cash flowing into my checking and savings account, is he going to do that? Not so much. He hasn't promised that. But what he has promised me is to give me my daily bread. And so every day when I pray to my father, Father, give me my daily bread, I, will, I, I can say that with confidence, knowing he will do that for me because he has promised that to me. 
And if I have problems managing my daily bread so that I'm living paycheck to paycheck, maybe I pray for wisdom because God, my Father in heaven, has promised me wisdom to help me manage the wealth that he has given to me. I pray for those things for which he has promised and do not doubt he will give them to me for he has promised it. And what is the greatest thing that we can call upon our Father for and he will do it? Well, he talked about that right at the end of the reading, didn't he? He said, how about pray for forgiveness and he will do it. No matter what it is that you've done, no matter what, is, what it is in your past that you are hiding from whoever, you pray for forgiveness, your father says, you are forgiven. That is a promise. Because that promise is found in Christ. And if you're having problems forgiving somebody else, we pray for that in the Lord's Prayer, don't we? Forgive me my sins. Now that I, my sins have been forgiven, now help me go and forgive that person that has offended me. Does that not move mountains? I don't know about you, but some of the most powerful words that somebody can say to me is, Paul, I forgive you. And more importantly, Jesus in heaven forgives you. That moves mountains for me. How might that move mountains for somebody in your life? To say to them, I forgive you. But more importantly, Jesus in heaven forgives you. Who knew that as we followed Jesus on his final steps that they would take us to a mountain and, and to a fig tree? And that we would hear these words that come out of Jesus' mouth that make him sound like a heartless, cold, judgmental brute. But words that are meant for you and for me so that we might repent. Words that might transform us into healthy trees bearing good fruit. Words that would move us to pray with confidence. The confidence that moves mountains because he has promised it. So let us walk with Jesus today and every day. Amen.